Good afternoon and welcome to the ELECT's virtual pre-conference, Planning for the Evolving Role of Metadata Services. This is a three-part virtual pre-conference being held this week, with the next two sessions on Wednesday and Thursday at this same time. I'm Santi Thompson, your host for today's presentation, Session 1, Metadata Services for Research Data Management, which includes two presentations. Our first presenter today is Anna Kraft. Anna is a member of the faculty at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she serves as metadata cataloger in the university libraries. She works with metadata for a variety of projects and systems, including the library catalog, digital projects, and NC Docs, UNCG's institutional repository. She started her library career at the North Carolina State University Libraries, served as metadata librarian at Western Carolina University, and earned her MLIS from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Our second presenter is Jared Lyle. Jared is Director of Curation Services at the Inner University Consortium for Political and Social Research, or ICPSR, the world's largest archive of digital social science data. His work includes developing and maintaining a comprehensive approach to data management and digital preservation policy. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. We will not be monitoring the Twitter feed, however. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen. The questions will be collated by myself and event co-coordinator Liz Woolcott. The speakers will answer them as time permits at the end of his or her presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we're on the air will be answered offline and the responses will be sent to all attendees. Finally, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and evaluation within two days. Please take time to fill out the evaluation form since it will be used by the committee to plan future events. And without further ado, I'll now pass it over to Anna for her presentation. All right, thank you, Santi. So hi, everyone. I'm Anna Kraft, and as Santi said, I work in the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where I'm the metadata cataloger located in the cataloging department. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the UNCG University Library's support for research data management needs on campus with a focus on the role of cataloging and metadata in this collaborative service. But bef before I go any farther, I have a quick question for all of you. I'd like to know if your library is currently providing research data management services for users. So really quick, take a moment uh, and answer that. This is just sort of to to see where everybody's at. All right, interesting. So a lot of you are thinking about it, and some of you are actually doing it. Thanks, thanks a lot for replying. Um, okay, and if we could... Are we switched back? Okay, yes, showing the screen. All right, uh, so first, some very quick background on UNCG. We're a public four-year research university located in the Piedmont Triad area of North Carolina. We're one of the 17 schools in the UNC system, and our enrollment is approximately 18,500 students. On this slide, you see a statue of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, who is the symbol for UNCG. Students leave apples on the statue as a wish for good luck on tests and exams. And here's some quick facts about the libraries. We have collection strengths in the areas of local and regional history, university history, women's history, and music and the performing arts, including the largest single holding of cello music related materials in the world. And in regard to staff, we have approximately 90 full-time employees in the libraries, with one third of those being tenured or tenure track faculty librarians. And the other thing you need to know about us is that we have a fairly robust IT department within the library, and we have a history of building and supporting products and projects that require a lot of IT development. Some examples appear on this slide. 
The main one that I'll talk about today is NC Docs. That's a shared institutional repository system which figures into our research data management work. So here's the brief rundown of what I'll cover today. Why are we doing this? Who is involved and whom do we support? What is it that we're doing? How we're doing it? What we're not doing? What's been difficult? And what we've learned? And I'll discuss much of this in the context of the role of metadata and those who work with it. So first, why are we doing this and what is our role? In the UNCG University Libraries, we see support for research data management as something that fits in well with our existing services and goals. We already work with faculty members to support their research needs. We're working to further a culture of support for open access, and we have a desire to extend our services in that area. And from a survey that we conducted in the spring of 2013, we found out that there are unmet needs in the area of data services on our campus. We've received requests from faculty members for assistance in this area, and we also want to make sure that we're positioned to help researchers meet guidelines established by granting agencies, such as the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. To add a little bit of context to the why part, here's a graph from that survey that I just mentioned. We conducted this to gather information on research data support needs on campus. And this went to faculty only, and the graph shows how respondents indicated that they're storing their research data. Respondents could check as many boxes as applied to their situations. 84% of them said that they're storing data on a computer hard drive. The survey also asked about data backup methods, and we learned that very few are using central locations such as network file space, 27%, or cloud storage, 26%. Most use CD or DVD, uh, CDs or DVDs, USB drives or external hard drives, that's 68%, or they use a computer hard drive, 58%. Respondents could check all that apply, so some use more than one strategy for backups but only 16% of them automatically generate backup files. So there are data sets that are going without backups and many data sets in potential danger of being lost. I'll provide a link to the fuller survey at the end of the presentation. Before I talk more specifically about what we're doing, I wanna say that we're not the only ones on our campus who are providing this type of support. Information Technology Services and the Office of Sponsored Programs both have roles in this area. OSP specifically with grant preparation and grant support, and IT with technology support, especially in relation to storage. There are also some programs housed within some of our schools and departments that provide assistance specifically to researchers in those areas. So here's a quick rundown of what we do in the libraries. We educate about data and data management. We assist in the creation of data management plans. We provide an option for sharing and archive, archiving data. This is through a partnership between our institutional repository and the Odom Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. I'll talk more about this shortly. Our support in this includes assistance with metadata and with the actual deposit of data in the repository. We also connect researchers to other non-library services. These could include other data repositories and other entities on campus, such as departmental resources, the Office of Sponsored Programs, or Information Technology Services. At the bottom of this slide, I have a snippet from our Lib Guide on Research Data Management, which is maintained by our Data Services Librarian. This resource provides basic information on data management and our services. The link to the full resource will be shown at the, uh, is shown at the bottom of the slide. Here's some additional specifics about what we do and who's involved at our library. Three departments have roles in this work. Cataloging, Research Outreach and Instruction, formerly known as Reference, now called ROI, and Electronic Resources and Information Technology, or ERIT. In cataloging, I'm the primary and currently only person involved in this work. I set metadata policies and create documentation, and I provide training, including for our li liaison librarians from the ROI department, for university faculty members, and for partners in our NC Docs institutional repository system. 
In ROI, our data services librarian, Linda Callum, is the point person for research data questions and assistance with the creation of data management plans. But our other liaison librarians are also involved to varying degrees, particularly with outreach and publicity in the, their departments, letting them know about our services. Our in-house IT department, ERIT, is also a piece of this puzzle. Their work mostly happens behind the scenes in building and working with our online systems. So in this work, who are our con constituencies? Our services are available to students, faculty, and staff on campus, but so far, to my knowledge, we have only been contacted by faculty members who have been interested in this type of support. Now I want to talk more specifically about our setup and the requests that we handle. In the university libraries, we provide a kind of in-house option for archiving and sharing data through a partnership between our institutional repository, that's NC Docs, and the Odom Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. The Odom Institute houses a data archive, that's the Odom Dataverse, part of the larger Dataverse project, and they provide data support services to researchers at UNC and beyond. Here's some quick background on NC Docs. NC Docs is the North Carolina Digital Online Collection of Knowledge and Scholarship, and it's a shared open access institutional repository that was built here at UNCG and is also used by seven other schools in the UNC system. At UNCG, NC Docs is open to scholarly works from faculty, staff, and students. Right now, UNCG has about 8,000 items in the repository, including articles, presentation slides, electronic theses and dissertations, audiovisual materials, and others. The database is crawled by Google, and the vast majority of item discovery comes through Google searches. Here's a snippet of a screen cap showing the NC Docs public user interface, limited just to UNCG works. The other participating schools are listed on the tan bar at the top, and as you can see, there's a search box in the middle and browsing options on the left. When we started NC Docs in about 2007, one of the criteria for inclusion was that works had to be complete. We did not want the repository to be used for drafts, incomplete works, or versioning. But this had to change a bit as we started to consider research data needs. We still want scholarly works to be complete, but the requirement for completeness does not apply to data sets, which may grow and change and may have multiple versions. There's one other important thing you should know about NC Docs. Unlike some IRs where users deposit their own works, in NC Docs, all item deposit and metadata activities are handled by personnel in the libraries. Right now, the cataloging department handles these tasks, though at earlier times there have been other departments involved in this work as well. We have one half-time grad student position that's dedicated to support for faculty publications and two paraprofessionals who work a few hours a week on NC Docs, one with electronic theses and dissertations and the other on faculty publications. The database is set up for harvesting via OAI PMH, and the data is harvested by the WorldCat Digital Collection Gateway, so our item records are available in WorldCat. There's also a Mark XML export option to get data out of the database. Here's an example of what an article landing page looks like in NC Docs. There's basic metadata about the creator, institution, and item, and there's a link to the full text PDF. So when we were starting to think about research data support on campus and about the needs of our faculty, we had to talk about formats. The survey I mentioned earlier included a question about data formats, and here are the responses. As you can see, our researchers are capturing data of many kinds. Some data is numerical or statistical and might be captured in spreadsheets or statistical software. Some data is textual, or it might be images or audio or video files. One researcher on this campus studies mockingbirds, and that person's data is audio files of thousands and thousands of mockingbird calls. So there's no one-size-fits-all approach for handling all research data. It just isn't possible. Now I'll get back to the NC Docs Odom Institute partnership. The Odom Institute set up a Dataverse instance for each of the NC Docs partner schools, and our developers worked to make the look and feel of the institutional Dataverse pages match that of NC Docs. What we're looking at here is a study page within NC Docs. Instead of a link to the full text of the item, we've got a link kind of in the middle uh, to the data and documentation. You can see it in yellow. It starts with uh, HDL handle. 
and when you click on that link, you go to this page. It looks like you're still in NC Docs, but at this point you've actually transitioned over to Dataverse, where you can find additional metadata about the item, the actual data set, and version information if applicable. So there are two systems here working together. End users don't need to know that the data sets don't actually live in NC Docs. They just need to be able to find and access what they're looking for. So here's a very quick comparison. NC Docs holds basic descriptive metadata about the data set, as well as a link to Dataverse. The data entry there is done by libraries personnel. The metadata fields are controlled and defined by libraries personnel. And the fields are very general to accommodate many types of scholarly works. Dataverse, on the other hand, holds both metadata and the actual data sets, with options for much more detailed metadata. Unlike NC Docs, the data entry is done by the researcher with support from the libraries if needed. I'll talk more about this in a moment. The metadata fields are controlled and defined by Dataverse, and the fields are designed to be specific to research data. So to be clear, the systems look like they're working together, but they don't actually share data. There's a small amount of dual entry of information, but we've not found it to be very onerous. Documentation has been very important to this project. There's existing documentation available in Dataverse, but I also created some that's specific to the NC Docs partners. This spreadsheet includes information on required and recommended fields, as well as recommended use of those fields, and it lists, lists the Dublin Core maps for those fields as applicable. This slide shows only a very small snippet of the spreadsheet, which also gives information on proper formatting of the fields, an example of potential field values. Now I want to quickly jump over to what we don't do. First, we don't accept legal responsibility for data that's deposited in the NC Docs Dataverse system. And this is the reason that the researchers have to be involved in the deposit and metadata process. In NC Docs, we take care of those things with completed scholarly works. But in Dataverse, there's a, a terms of use agreement where the person who is submitting the data must take responsibility for it. I'll show an example of that in a moment. Another reason for having the researchers involved in the metadata and Dataverse is that the researchers or the people on their teams know much, much more about their research areas than we do. When we do basic metadata entry on a scholarly work that's being deposited in NC Docs, we can generally pretty easily obtain the metadata from the item or a citation, information like the title, authors, date, the publication it's coming from, etc. The metadata we enter there is brief and general, but in Dataverse, there are some important pieces of information that are not self-evident or may not be directly available to us. Who is the funding agency, if applicable? When did the data collection start and end? Where was the data collected? What is the universe or population of subjects? There are approximately 100 fields available in Dataverse, and while we don't require or recommend the use of all of them, they are available for researchers if they decide that they want to be very specific and detailed in describing their data. We also do not store confidential or sensitive data, even though there are options to make data sets private or restricted to just certain users. If the data is truly confidential and will never be shareable, then Dataverse is not a good deposit option for it. And I'll note that at present in the libraries, we do not have a good option to meet that kind of storage need. But if we start to get requests for that type of service, then that might change. Here's the terms of use agreement that I mentioned on the previous slide. Because researchers know their data much better than we do, we ask that they take responsibility for their data sets and that they do not contain information that could identify subjects. We will help them with the data entry, but they have to be the ones that click this box. And here's how the process generally works. Usually first, a researcher contacts the liaison librarian for his or her department. The liaison librarian explains our services and the potential options for data deposit, including but not limited to Dataverse. If the researcher needs assistance with Dataverse and or metadata, the liaison librarian will contact me. I answer their questions and try to get a feel for their needs, and if they've decided to use Dataverse, then I'm available to assist them in loading materials into the system and completing the metadata entry. 
I also complete an associated metadata record in NC Docs in order to create a connection between the NC Docs and Dataverse records. Here's some examples of general requests that I get. Some are informational, wanting to know about what services we provide. These might come to me from our liaisons, wanting to know more about my role in assisting researchers with Dataverse and metadata, or they might come directly from researchers, wanting to know about our services as they prepare a data management plan. I also get technical support requests from researchers who are using Dataverse, and also from library personnel at our NC Docs partner institutions when they run into technical issues in NC Docs and Dataverse. And then there are training requests, mostly on how to use Dataverse. These generally come from the liaison librarians, NC Docs partners, and sometimes from researchers. I'll note here that to date we have not had many researchers elect to use the Dataverse portion of the service, or if they have, they have not, it has been part of a, uh, in a data, written into a data management plan, but they are just starting to collect their data and have, are not yet ready to deposit it. Not all research data requests that come through this process get funneled to me, and not all that come to me get added to Dataverse. Some requests come at the data management plan stage and they just need to know about Dataverse and other options. They aren't yet ready to deposit the data because they haven't collected it yet. And as I mentioned before, research data doesn't come in one size. Sometimes we get requests from researchers who are looking for assistance and NC Docs isn't the best place for their data. Perhaps there's a subject specific repository that's a, be a better fit, or perhaps the data is in another form, images, audio, or something else that wouldn't be well served in Dataverse, which is really meant to work with statistical data. In thinking about repository options, our subject liaison librarians often help direct these questions. Here are the main challenges that we've run into with this service. When we originally started planning to support research data management, we intended to hire a position that would coordinate and publicize this work. That position would have worked closely with liaison librarians, information technology personnel, and me to bring together the needed pieces to support faculty research. But as with many libraries, we've had some tough recent budget years and we weren't able to hire for that position. As such, we haven't had a coordinated push to publicize the service on campus, though we've certainly shared the information on a small scale as questions come up and as liaisons see opportunities in their departments. I'll note that at, at this point we have, to my knowledge, really only reached out to faculty members in regard to this service. We're open to working with other campus constituents, including students and staff, but we've not yet reached out to those groups in an organized manner. Communication and publicity in general can be challenging with any new library service, finding the best way to get the information out to the people that need it. And we're still somewhat hesitant in this area, not wanting to publicize too widely and then end up unable to support all of the requests. We've also run into several instances where the changing nature of data related practices and expectations have created problems for researchers who had hoped to share their data. One researcher contacted us last month with questions about our services. And after we'd shared information about Dataverse and the process around using it, she came back and said she'd just realized that her original data collection plan from many years ago stated that the data would be destroyed at a certain date. She had forgotten that the provision was in there and because of it, she's unable to share or save that data. And with some researchers we've spoken to about this, there's been a general lack of enthusiasm for the one more thing to do aspect of this. Researchers tend to really like that we take care of everything, including checking copyright, loading items, providing metadata for their articles and other scholarly works and NC docs. And we all know that faculty members already have a lot on their plates. So for some of them, it seems that changing standards around data management, including mandates from funding agencies, may be the motivation that they need to actually undertake this type of work. But despite the challenges, we found value in preparing and providing these services. Here's some of the ways that this has helped strengthen, has helped our campus. It strengthens relationships between the libraries, researchers, and scholarly communities. It meets the needs of campus constituencies. As we learned from that survey we did in 2013, there's some areas where researchers really need support and we're trying to help with some of those services. It also helps support new publishing and sharing models and it demonstrates a commitment to open access, which is important to our institution. 
So here's what we're planning to do as we move forward. We're going to continue to follow developments in this area and determine where we fit in. We're going to consider further extending our service offerings when the budget allows. And we'd like to further spread the word to researchers on our campus, letting them know how we can help. Along with this goes the need for education about our services, about data management practices in general. We've definitely seen the need for more education on campus, so that needs to be part of this work. So that's all I have for you today. Um, there's my contact information, and then my final slide is links to some research data management related services and information that I mentioned during the presentation. Thank you all, and if you've got questions, um, I'd be glad to take them. Thanks so much, Anna. Uh, currently, we have one question, but I will remind folks that if you do have questions, be sure to enter them into the questions module on the screen. So Anna, here's a question. Does your library assist researchers with cleaning the data, the data sets, before they are deposited into Dataverse? That's a great question, and it's one that we haven't actually run into yet. So nobody has asked for that type of help yet, but if they did, then I think uh, it would probably be a case-by-case -case sort of situation to, to, uh, after we determined how much work was involved in that and how much time we had to potentially support that type of work. So the answer is maybe. <laughs> okay. Another question, um, someone's asking, how many staff in the library IT department does it take to sort of facilitate this process? Um, so our IT department has a couple of developers who are the ones that actually work on the back end of connecting NC Docs and Dataverse. There are two of them, but the IT department is um, probably about five times that size. There are at least 10 people. I, off the top of my head, um, I don't know the exact number, but there are between maybe 10 and 12 people in the IT department total. Great. Another question, what kinds of training do you offer and who are the audiences? Um, a lot of the training we've done so far has been, there have been some individual sessions with researchers who want to actually see the process. So we sit down with them, usually me and one of the liaison librarians, sit down with them, uh, show them Dataverse, show them how to log in, talk to them about the metadata fields and how to use them. And then there, uh, I also do training with um, our NC Docs partners to show them the back end of NC Docs and Dataverse and get them working on uh, entering the metadata in both of those systems. So generally the audiences are faculty members or librarians either here or at other schools. Okay. Another question, what metadata schema does UNC use for Dataverse? So we are using what's actually, what is provided by Dataverse, so we don't have any control over that. Many of the fields are mapped to Dublin Core, but we are just using Dataverse, Dataverse's metadata scheme as provided. And do they articulate what specific scheme or it just sort of is built into the system? Um, I do, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I know that many of the fields are mapped to Dublin Core, which is what we use in NC Docs and many of our other projects. And if there's something beyond that, then I, right now, I, I don't know. Okay, great. Another question. Could you explain again the rationale of having to work with two systems, both NC Docs and Dataverse? Sure, that's a great question. The, we wanted the data sets to be discoverable in NC Docs, since that's what we're using as our institutional repository, and we've already got a large um, corpus of scholarly works from UNCG. We wanted to be able to present the metadata or basic metadata about those data sets, as well as a link to them alongside of completed works that might reference those data sets. But NC Docs is not built to support data specifically. It's a very lightweight system in terms of metadata. Uh, and Dataverse, as you saw, is built specifically for research data. So that's where the data actually lives. And what we have in NC Docs is just very bare bones records that basically link out to that data. So users can discover they have now 
multiple access points. They can discover the data sets by going through Dataverse, or they can find them in NC Docs, where they may also find more context in the um, other works of those researchers that are in there. Great. We have a few more questions. Uh, do either systems handle ORCID IDs? That's something that we would love to add in NC Docs, but we have not yet not yet been able to do that. We may be looking into that in the future. And actually, I do, I'm not sure if those are usable in Dataverse. I'll have to look into that. That's a good question. Okay. I have a few more. Do you have any observations or comments on the pros and cons of storing data with Dataverse instead of locally? Um, you know, I don't think that we really have a good, um, a, another good option, at least in terms of making data shareable, in terms of sharing it locally. Um, Dataverse lets us use, or lets us make those data sets available and searchable through NC Docs, through other web interfaces. If we were only doing it locally, then there really wouldn't be a good access point, or we don't have a good access point at, the, at this point. Um, with, those, with the data sets that I mentioned that we don't currently support, the ones that include sensitive or confidential information, things that would not be shared, that's something that really would probably be, be, be handled by campus IT if those data sets needed to be kept but not shared. So that's something that, and as I said before, that's not something that we have been, we have yet seen many um, requests for, any requests for that I know of. Great. Do you have options for different controlled vocabulary terms that are specific to disciplines uh, within the metadata and Dataverse? I believe the answer to that question is yes. I would have to go log into the system and double check, but if I recall correctly, then there are, you may be able to choose from a drop down what the controlled vocabulary is that you're using, and I think they have a number of them, or if they, if it's not a drop down, then you would enter what the controlled vocabulary is that you're using. Um, I remember seeing or using Library of Congress subject headings in there in one test item, and I believe there are many others that you're able to use. Okay. Do you try to engage with researchers to help them craft their surveys with subsequent data management in mind? That is not something that, not the sort of task that would be in my area, but that is something that the liaison librarians would potentially help with. So that is something that we, depending on on the particular situation, um, that could be something that the, li the liaison librarians here would help with. Okay. Someone's asking for clarification whether you can repeat the staff size you've been working on uh, metadata, including yourself and student workers. Sure. So for Dataverse, or for this type of work, our requests so far have been pretty low, so in the metadata area, it has really just been me working on it. But with NC Docs in general, we have a half-time student who works on faculty publications, and then two full-time staff who have part of their work in this area. And if we see large increases in requests in this area, then we could potentially, or may potentially increase the, the hours that are given in, uh, in cataloging to this task. Okay. Oh, and one thing I've, uh, with that question that came up a few moments ago about pros and cons of storing data with Dataverse instead of locally. Dataverse, this is one thing that just popped into my head, Dataverse uh, is really, as I've said, meant to support research data and they generate all kinds of backups. And so in terms of preservation and migration and things like that, those are now things that we don't have to worry about so much um, since we're getting help from them in that area. Great. 
So we have another question. Does NCDOC support author profiles? Yes, we do have author profiles, but um, they are not currently able to link out to other author ID services like ORCID and others, so it's currently just a local profile system. Okay, another question, are, what are the challenges of maintaining a homegrown system and what are your future plans? Um, I, I would probably need to get our developers in here to help with some of the challenges. Um, it, I, NC Docs was built here at UNCG and it's been around for almost 10 years now. And one of the challenges I would say is that we, since we are a small organization, we don't have the funding to do really big things like incorporate ORCID IDs quickly. Uh, that could be maybe a project that would be done over a number, or well, a number of months or potentially longer, um, because our developers are working on other things as well. This is a small, um, small project. Um, let's see. It, I might have to think about that one a little bit more to see if I've got uh, other things to say about that. But it's, I think for me, it's been a really great, really interesting project to be part of because we've gotten to work with other schools in the area and get to meet people at those institutions. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I have posit very positive things to say about it, but I think it probably can be a little bit more challenging with, um, the, on the development side, which is not something that I am involved in. Well, knowing that this next question may be difficult to answer, but I'm going to ask <laughs> it anyway. Is there a cost for using Dataverse, or can you maybe explain what some of the costs are around uh, implementing Dataverse? Um, I'm not sure that I, how much I would be allowed to say about our agreement with them. Um, um, that, I the costs, well, I, can't, I don't think that I can say anything specific about the costs that our organization has, um, but they have been great to work with, and anytime we've had a problem, um, we, they have been very responsive. Um, in terms of non-monetary costs, really, uh, the only other thing has been time in terms of learning the system and providing training to people who would who are using it. Uh, so once we sort of got the documentation created on this end um, and learned about how to use it and how to train others to use it, at this point we're sort of at a baseline of being able to go out and help people and the, the costs in that area are pretty low. Okay. Probably the last question, do you have a policy to define your scope of collections? That's a great question and the answer is no, we don't currently have a policy in that area. That's something that we probably need, but as I've said I think a couple of times, we, we have not gotten a ton of requests yet in this area or actually we've not gotten a lot of requests that have gone through the whole process and have had data to deposit. Um, so it's been sort of a case-by-case -case basis at this point. But as we continue to see the service grow, then I think we will need more of a policy in that area. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and thanks everyone for asking them. If you did ask a question for Anna and we didn't have a chance to answer it now, if we have time after Jared's presentation and his questions, we can come back to those. And like we said at the beginning of the um, webinar, uh, any unanswered questions will be answered offline and sent to you all, so stay tuned. And thanks so much, Anna, for that great presentation. And next, we're going to hand it over to Jared. Okay, great. Thanks, Santi. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. 
So I'm going to talk today about um, DDI metadata uh, or Data Documentation Initiative metadata, which is an XML standard to support research data management. And really, the metadata is a bridge between data producers and data users and using metadata to bring data to life. I'm going to focus on using metadata for discovery and access, but I'm also going to provide some uh, examples of using the DDI metadata when collecting and actually managing uh, the research data uh, prior to handing it over to an archive or uh, a repository uh, to provide discovery and access. So just as context, I work at uh, ICPSR. We're a social science data archive uh, at the University of Michigan. We've been around for a little over 50 years. We started out in the 60s as a consortium uh, for sharing and archiving and preserving data collections. Things have come a long way now. Data is a, a hot topic, of course. Um, but uh, over time, we've uh, developed some systems and, and metadata standards for uh, handling and capturing metadata. We have a number of archives uh, at ICPSR, primarily in the social and behavioral sciences. Um, uh, many of them are, or some of them are sponsored by the federal government. Others are uh, sponsored by our uh, members or uh, of the consortium. We have over 750 members. And they range from anything from criminal justice to aging to uh, substance abuse. So uh, over time, over the last 50 years and even longer, um, data have come in many different forms, uh, punch cards, uh, tapes. More recently, we have them in these statistical packages. And you're able to document the data more and more within the packages. Um, but uh, you know, even 20 years ago, the ability to actually document the code books and describe all of the other information related to the data collections was somewhat limited. Uh, in fact, oftentimes the code books uh, were uh, printed, uh, weren't able to be reused. Uh, when things were more computerized, they were in just almost like uh, ASCII raw uh, textual formats, uh, which made it somewhat easier to search, but still uh, tough to reuse and adapt, especially if you're collecting the data. Uh, and so over time, people really requested uh, a, a better standard or format for doing that because metadata are collected and accumulated so that uh, you can reuse them and uh, you want to provide a complete record, especially as data sets are evolving and growing. And so now uh, there are uh, standards for, for doing this, uh, and I'm going to talk about one standard in the social uh, and behavioral sciences is called DDI. This is just an example of a DDI uh, record um, where information is captured. Um, I'll talk about later how uh, you can follow skip patterns, you can see notes, there might be question text and so forth. Uh, and this information can be reused and uh, readapted. The Data Documentation Initiative is a metadata standard for the community. Um, it's an XML standard uh, where you can describe data collections both at the study level, so describing the overall collection, but also uh, down to the variable or values. Uh, within the study itself, or within the data. This is an example from a, a survey of consumer attitudes and behavior. Who's using DDI? Uh, and again, DDI stands for Data Documentation Initiative, although more recently uh, people are calling it data discovery and interoperability. Uh, a number of people around and organizations around the world, uh, everyone from Europe, says does in Europe, uh, to Australia, to here in the US, some larger scale social surveys, general social survey um, to New, New Zealand and the World Bank uh, as a big user. Brief history of DDI uh, started out back in 1995, so almost 20 years ago. 
uh, a code book was, was published in 2000, and more recently, uh, newer versions or updated versions of DDI has, have been established so that you can capture not just simple survey type data or catalog records, but also complex data, so hierarchical, longitudinal, comparative, uh, multiple languages, detailed geographic information, and also reusable resources such as question banks, concepts, variable banks. And really, uh, it supports this idea of a metadata-driven life cycle. So uh, data collections aren't static. Uh, we're, uh, when people are collecting data, they're enriching it from uh, the very beginning, so at the concepts, to the collection where they have questionnaires or uh, paradata information about the data, such as the time uh, the question was asked, how long the interviewer spent on the question, uh, down to the processing of the collection, so uh, how the variables were created, to the distribution, um, and then really to the archiving and, and discovery portion and the analysis. So there's all sorts of information gathered and collected throughout the um, data management portion, as well as the, the data archiving preservation uh, aspects of the data lifecycle. Uh, what are the benefits of, of using the structured metadata? Well, it's rich content. There are a number of, a huge number of categories to describe collections. Uh, you can reuse metadata across the life cycle. So for instance, you might have a question that you ask. You can ask it again. You can embed it within uh, the metadata itself. It's machine actionable. It's a platform independent. It's XML. Uh, it captures information about data management and curation. There's support for longitudinal data and comparison. And there's a, a global network of users. Uh, so there's uh, opportunity for interoperability. Just, uh, just to give you some context um, of some benefits of using it and who's using it when capturing uh, the data themselves. Uh, and data, the data management portion of, of creating a, a collection. Uh, this is an example um, uh, from the MIDAS study uh, at Wisconsin now. It originally started at, I believe, Harvard. It's a huge national longitudinal study of health and well-being. There are thousands of respondents over multiple waves. It's longitudinal again. And there are tens of thousands of variables. and uh, the MIDAS project uh, originally was capturing all of this metadata in static codebooks, and they really needed a, a system for enriching and describing um, all of the information about the, the data. And so they uh, used uh, DDI as their standard. And uh, I should say, uh, at the, I'm, I've tried to include as many of uh, references and notes in the, the slides, which will be available for download. So what they, they've done is use DDI uh, to uh, capture information about uh, their variables, their questions, constructed variables, uh, the question flow, and they've embedded all of this in the metadata, and so they can create um, some neat uh, user guides. This is uh, an example of a uh, code book that's available online that shows values and frequencies and skip patterns and so forth. Uh, one of the investigators from MIDAS actually recently, I think just a month ago, gave a, a great presentation on the value of using um, this DDI metadata for capturing uh, MIDAS or longitudinal data, and it's posted online. Uh, I give the, the link there. Uh, if you're interested in, in seeing the perspective of a researcher using uh, metadata, uh, especially DDI metadata, uh, please do watch this. It's a, it's a great presentation. It shows some, some neat examples. Uh, there's some tools out there for capturing the DDI metadata. It's of course, XML, and so be, can be complex if you're just looking at it and trying to capture it with an XML editor. 
Uh, one, just throwing these out there as examples, uh, is Nestar Publisher. This is a free software for download. Uh, and you can actually go in and uh, within the data themselves uh, uh, describe uh, variables, describe question text, uh, I think generate DDI uh, metadata, uh, and generate code books and so forth. Another is Collectica. Uh, this is Collectica Designer. Again, just providing these ex as examples, uh, not endorsing them, although I do know these are, are good products from what I've heard. Uh, this is uh, the URL. Uh, Midas actually has used Collectica uh, to, I think, design their surveys to capturing uh, information over different waves uh, to also distributing the, the metadata and the, da the data. So that's a, just a background about DDI, where it came from, how researchers use it. I'm, I'm really going to focus now on um, metadata for discovery and access. So using this rich uh, metadata that's captured or can be captured to provide access uh, specifically through an archive. ICPSR has over 8,000 studies, each with study level and variable level metadata. We use uh, the DDI metadata standard. We use DDI codebook. Uh, and it drives much of our site's functionality, and I'll show you in just a second. So what happens is that people upload uh, data. It can be in SPSS or SAS or Stata or R or whatever format they have, as well as documentation uh, in different formats. Usually the documentation comes to us in codebook, in the form of a codebook or a questionnaire or a user guide. And from there, we'll then uh, generate a study description, uh, and uh, we'll also generate variable description. And um, so I'll show you. For the overall study, this is a, a screenshot of our data deposit form, and you can see the URL there. Here, users or depositors can describe their collections, upload their studies, uh, data files and descriptive files, which then comes into us. And from there, we then generate, use that information to generate the study level DDI elements. This include title, principal investigator, subject terms, uh, to sampling, weights, version history, and so forth. And study level DDI are leveraged in several ways. So uh, provides a basis for a search which is based on solar, lucene, faceted searching. Uh, it can be repurposed uh, across our different topical archive sites, which have different looks and feel. Uh, it also provides for inter interoperability, so other archives and libraries can use our metadata to populate uh, shared catalogs or their own catalogs. And then also uh, the study level DDI can be bundled uh, as PDFs uh, with each download. So specifically, study level DDI search on our site. We have a find and analyze uh, section. Uh, there's also a find data box on our main page. If you search for data, um, the search results show up. Uh, and then if you want to drill down, for instance, to this capital punishment in the United States, um, all of this is based on the study level metadata um, that's associated with the data collection. So you can see here, uh, PI, principal investigator summary. If you were to scroll down, you'd see method methodology and other information. This study level metadata can then be repurposed for different uh, sections of our site or different topical archives that we have. So this capital punishment in the United States uh, also appears on the National Archive of Criminal Justice data, which is a topical archive run and supported uh, here at ICPSR, uh, funded by uh, National Institutes of Justice and, and, and a few other agencies. So the look and feel is a little different, but the, the core metadata is the same. Uh, so study level, we can uh, share the metadata and uh, allow for interoperability. 
Uh, so we at ICPSR are a member of the Data Preservation Alliance for the Social Sciences, a uh, number of data archives here in the United States. Odom Institute, which was mentioned in the previous pres presentation, is a member of DataPass, um, the Roper Center, Harvard, uh, the National Archives, um, UCLA, and a few others, uh, Cornell, uh, and the Qualitative Data Repository. Uh, so we have a shared catalog, and the shared catalog is populated by these DDI records. So um, people can search across the different archives, and then if they find a, a specific study, uh, they can then link out to that particular archive. And then the study level DDI is used to generate this PDI, P, I'm sorry, PDF overview, which is bundled within the data downloads, uh, as well as viewable online. Um, just another way of reviewing a study description and providing a, a, a key overview or summary of the collection. Uh, the study descriptions can be uh, exported in a different number of different formats, Dublin Core, Mark. So we not only generate the study level information from that data deposit form, but we also generate variable level uh, descriptive metadata. Uh, and this is generated from the data files themselves. And so um, these include variable names, labels, descriptive variable text, question text, summary statistics notes. Basically, as much information as the investigator can provide us, uh, we'll uh, attempt to extract as much as we can automatically from the data collection and also uh, add whatever we can, either manually or programmatically, from the documentation files. And this variable level DDI is leveraged in several ways. One, uh, through search. So not only when you're searching, are you searching at this high level information that is just the summary, but you're searching uh, across individual variables so very granular information. Um, and you're searching across the entire uh, ICPSR collection, so millions of variables. And it serves as the foundation for our social science, what we call our social science variables database. And uh, it also provides, um, it's leveraged uh, to generate code books with detailed frequency counts, uh, again, at the variable level. So I'll show you some examples. So at the search, on a study homepage, for, uh, this is for a study called Sit-Ins and Desegregation in the U.S. South in the early 1960s. Uh, there is a section called Variables where you can list out all, for this one, there are 405 variables in the study. Uh, but you can also search the variables uh, for specific terms or phrases. And so if I clicked on the listing of all the variables, I'd be able to see not only the names, but also the labels, uh, as well as from which study that variable is taken. And then if I click on that particular variable, um, looks like it didn't show a screenshot, but I would be able to see uh, the frequency listings, even question text, uh, uh, maybe the question that was asked for that particular variable. The variable level DDI, is so you can search across the entire collection and compare variables even. Uh, there's a section on our find and analyze data page called search compare variables. And so you can see here, I've searched for the term heroin and I'm shown, it looks like 16, over 16,000 um, variables with heroin uh, in some portion of that variable, whether the name or the label or even the question text or the notes. As long as it's in the metadata, it's uh, able to be searched. Uh, I'm able to um, not only see which uh, 
variables or studies have the, that particular term, but I'm also able to compare across variables. So if I select, let's say, um, three of them, uh, I'm able to view them uh, in comparison with each other. And this is sometimes valuable for uh, people who are designing surveys uh, uh, to review what previous information has been collected before. It's useful for students and uh, it also can be useful when um, just comparing different uh, waves or different uh, surveys across time. So that's the search and compare variables. And then the variable level DDI is used to uh, generate very detailed code books. So uh, you get not only the, the question text, but the values, the labels, uh, frequency listings to the types and the locations and uh, actually the types uh, uh, where the, the data are found in the actual data files. Uh, something we've done recently, very recently, is we're, we're able to provide a unified search using this uh, variable level metadata as well as the study level metadata so that when you search um, and for now, it's just across uh, some of our topical archives. Um, you're able to see the results from not just studies, but also variables as well as um, publications. So we collect data information about publications tied to data collections. So if I searched in this example for gender uh, within the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, which is a topical archive at ICPSR, you're able to see where those results are generated and actually drill down into um, those results. So for instance, here in gender, there are 115 variables uh, with that term somewhere in it. And then if I uh, click on the variables, I'm able to see which of those um, the context behind those variables and can drill down even further and go into uh, those data collections, download the data, or even analyze it or review it online. So there are a lot of benefits for um, collecting uh, and providing uh, this uh, rich study and variable level metadata to an archive. Of course, we uh, would prefer and, and really um, encourage data providers to provide as much metadata they can to us. Um, if they do it in DDI using Collectica or Neststar or another product, uh, great. If they don't, we can, as an archive, uh, capture some of that information ourselves and even enhance the data collections. That's what we do at ICPSR. We'll curate the collections at a pretty intense level for, for many of the collections. Um, but we can only do as much as uh, the data provider, data depositor uh, gives us. So if they don't give us the question text and it's not in the code book, um, then there's not much we can do. If it is in a code book, uh, we might have to try and rip out that information and it can be very labor intensive, but it still can be useful. So how do we improve metadata in the future? Uh, getting structured metadata in the, some sort of a rich format for us, especially DDI is great. At deposit, that's the gold standard. Um, and that way we can ensure that all of this rich metadata that's captured, especially when producers are generating surveys um, through uh, automated systems, CADI, CAPI, or other tools, um, that that metadata and information isn't lost. Um, and that improving metadata that it's accumulated throughout the entire um, data life cycle um, that people are capturing it, not just at the very end when they're preparing it for archiving or uh, deposit and repository, but capturing all of that information um, through um, conceptualization to collection to working with the data and then at the end, of course, to handing it over to an archive or repository. Um, and then uh, moving to uh, the DDI uh, lifecycle, so where we can describe 
um, not just static uh, surveys, but these rich, you know, really intensive collections is also a goal. So with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, uh, and I'm also here, of course, to, to answer any questions that are submitted right now. Thanks so much, Jared. Uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to enter them into the questions module. Okay, Jared, we have a question. How many other metadata schema were you able to find and compare to DDI? Well, I think it's been mapped to a large number of other metadata schema uh, out there. Uh, I think I showed you that we can transform it into Dublin Core, Mark Records, um, uh, I think a, a large number of others. The DDI Alliance website has some examples and maybe lists uh, uh, all of the mappings that are out there. Okay, we have another question asking, what's the expectation around DDI knowledge and should the researcher be the expert? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, as more and more tools are now available, I think um, that researchers, uh, of course, DDI can, especially if you go down into the weeds, can be very intensive, uh, complicated. But as these tools are now available, especially, um, uh, I think I showed you the Collectica tool, of course, that costs some money. There's what's called Collectica for Excel, uh, which is, uh, I think, free or maybe just a few dollars to use, and that's very lightweight and allows you to, um, for a researcher, to very easily add value labels, um, question text. Um, I think the other tool that I showed, um, which was Nestar Publisher, that's another pretty easy to use tool where researchers can pretty easily um, enhance uh, the description of their data collection. Um, that that enables the the researcher to um, to further enhance their their collections. I think we don't expect researchers to you know know a whole lot about DDI and hope that the the tools uh, development will continue. That more and more tools will be made available. Um, but we're well, like I say, Nestar, Collectica, other tools are available. Uh, and even just providing an archive like ICPSR with um, as much metadata and machine readable format as possible, where we can do some of that work for them as well to generate the, you know, the especially the variable level metadata. What we try to do is, uh, and the ideal is, removing as many barriers as possible for the researchers. So I guess the short answer is, no, I, I, I don't expect uh, the everyday researcher to know a whole lot about DDI. What I do hope is that they'll do um, as much as possible to, uh, and to describe and enhance their collections, especially from the beginning using some of these tools and then providing that information to, to an archive or repository so that we can use that information. That's some great advice, Jared. Do you have other suggestions on how to talk to faculty about getting help with their data? Well, I, I think more and more, you know, local librarians, liaison librarians uh, at their individual institutions are, are very knowledgeable about metadata, uh, about describing collections, even just creating basic 
metadata, I think that's a great start you know, working at the local level. Um, we've got some, I think, some pretty good resources on the ICPSR main site, um, which they can use. We have a guide to um, collecting and describing data collections. Um, and other than that, just reach out. Reach out to, again, your local resources uh, and also to domain repositories like us uh, and, and others out there uh, from the very beginning. We can, we can point you to some, some good resources and tools um, and help you from, from the very beginning. I think the, the earlier you prepare, and I think, you know, obviously I'm preaching to the, I'm talking to the choir here, uh, the more they can do and the easier it is for them to capture the, this rich information. Great. We have another question. In your presentation, you mentioned 8,000 studies at ICPSR. Is that sort of that 8,000 number? Does that include, are all of those DDI-related um, projects? Or if not, is there any attempt to retro-catalog the others? Yeah, so many of those, we created the DDI uh, when the investigators submitted the information and we continue to retrofit older studies. And so what that means is we'll go in, take the data, data sets that they provide us and generate or rip out um, the variable level information uh, and then generate the DDI from that. Uh, for data collections that uh, are minimally described where they don't have a whole lot of, let's say variable, uh, details or variable names or variable labels. Uh, it takes even more work for us to enhance that, so we'll actually have to go in, if, if we do this level of curation, we'll go into the code books and actually type in um, the metadata and even the question text for that particular data collection. So it's on an ongoing process to um, continue to, to update and retrofit our collections. But we have, I think, um, many of our collections are now uh, in the, the variable database. Uh, and I want to say it's two or three million, maybe more variables are now, um, can be searched and, and compared. Okay, another question. What types of data is DDI not suitable for? In those cases, what schema would you recommend? Well, um, I think there's, you know, for the physical or life sciences, there are a number of, especially um, uh, a number of metadata standards that are being developed or available uh, that DDI probably wouldn't work as well for. Um, it seems like there are new uh, standards uh, being developed all the time, which has its pros and cons. Um, but I, I, I would say it's probably not the best uh, standard to use if you have something from the, let's say, biological or um, physical sciences. There are other standards out there. That, that said, I should say uh, DDI is able to, uh, especially with, with more recent work, capture um, biological and, and physical information from these surveys. I, I think I mentioned the MIDAS survey. Um, they're actually capturing um, some really uh, detailed physiological uh, and biological uh, information and capturing it within the DDI metadata. Um, and so there are ways to capture that information, but um, if you're you know, purely in the physical or biological uh, sciences, I think there are some probably better standards out there that are more tailored to your, uh, to your types of data collections. Okay, can you share maybe some of your experiences with um, working with researchers? How much effort is involved in creating DDI from raw data? Um, or for, for 
raw data or PDFs for the for the code book. How much effort is for the researcher, or how much is it for us? We'll go with both. Okay. Yeah. So um, there have been some examples where researchers have actually used DDI to capture and generate um, the metadata as they've collected um, the data collection. And uh, for them, uh, really it isn't any more work that since they're capturing it in real time. And at the very end of their collection, all they have to do is bundle up that DDI and the data collection and pass it off to us. And then really for us, it's pretty easy uh, since we have the DDI, we don't have to do a whole lot of extra work. Um, so, you know, that's an ideal situation where an investigator has captured all of that rich information throughout the project. Um, in other cases, uh, maybe someone didn't think so much about metadata beforehand before they started the collection or it wasn't a priority. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's an example where um, we're still happy to, to archive the collection, but it takes some more work um, for us. Uh, especially to um, generate uh, the question text or the variable labels. Um, if they have that in a machine readable format, we can write some scripts and, and, and it makes it a little bit easier to um, process that and, and put that into a DDI type format. Um, if it's in uh, you know, a non-machine readable format, let's say it's an image or um, even in print format, then of course we'd have to get some manual, a lot of manual or elbow grease to uh, to enrich or to capture that that metadata. So it really depends on you know what the investigator has done throughout uh, his or her uh, data collection process, uh, and then the the information that they then provide to us. Great. We have another question. Is weeding or disposition part of the DDI lifecycle? Is weeding or disposition part? So by that, do they mean um, throwing out portion of the, the collection? That's a great question. Stephanie, if you want to elaborate on that, you can. So maybe, maybe approach the weeding part first. Yeah, so of course you can put as much, as many details in um, the DDI metadata as you want. Uh, so you can capture, uh, you know, anything down to specific notes about variables uh, and why or why you didn't capture information. So I, I, that's how I interpret the weeding or disposition. So yes, you, you can use DDI to um, describe what you did or didn't collect as well as why you got rid of particular variables or particular data points. Great. So we're going to bring Anna back now because uh, we have an interesting question that asks sort of both of you to reflect on your work. So the question is, the first speaker mentioned that few researchers were using Dataverse in favor of local repositories, while the second speaker seemed to say that it's common for social, sciences, social, social science researchers to use ICPSR to store data rather than seek a local solution. Could you talk about some of the possible reasons for these contrasting situations? Uh, this is Anna. So, uh, one thing that I did not address in my presentation that maybe I should have is that m researchers who may, many in the social sciences, may already be using ICPSR or other um, subject specific database, databases and repositories and they may not come to us at all. So there are, there's a subset of researchers on campus that may not request this type of service and they may already be using ICPSR and other services that um, that are similar. So I have no way to represent the number of faculty members that are potentially doing that. Um, and with Dataverse, they 
researchers here also have the option to not use us at all in terms of getting into that system. They have the ability to use that system without going through us. So there may be some researchers that are doing that. Um, that might be an interesting topic for a survey on campus, checking into, or an additional, additional survey on campus, checking into whether or not uh, we can get data on if researchers are using some of those repositories. Um, so yeah, that I should have been a little bit more clear on that when I was speaking. That's a good question. And, and just to add to that, I think there are pros to, to both the local um, data solution, uh, you know, especially local liaisons who have direct ties to researchers and can really provide that local expertise and, and um, direct assistance. Um, and but there's also, I think, pros for a domain repository like ICPSR. We have, you know, we do work with these types of data all the time um, and have expertise in the metadata and also that uh, intensive curation. So the cleaning of the data, um, we, we do handle restricted or confidential data um, through both a virtual enclave, through uh, a physical enclave, so we're able to, to handle things. But I, I, you know, I think especially as we move forward, uh, you know, from that poll we saw that a number of people have developed or are developing, that there is this increased opportunity for domain repositories to work hand in hand with local repositories. And I don't think it's always, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or, um, it could be an and. You know, when, if someone deposits data with us, we don't uh, we don't prohibit them from depositing it at their local repository as well. Um, there are pros and cons for having data deposited at multiple locations, but um, you know, there's some services that domain repositories can offer, which are a little bit more enhanced and customized, especially to a domain. And there's some services that local repositories can offer um, that domain repositories can't, especially that customized um, in-person assistance. Okay. And Jared, how many people at I ICPSR specifically work on metadata? Well, we have uh, two metadata librarians who are in charge of things like subject terms, um, controlled vocabulary, uh, quality control, and they're split across study level metadata as well as our bibliography of data related literature. Um, but then we have a large number of data curators or processors who go in and clean the data. And those are the people who are on the front lines who actually use the study level metadata and the variable level metadata to describe the collections. And so, you know, we have two full-time librarians and then within the organization, we probably have, um, I want to say 30 to 50 dedicated processors or data curators who work with the collections who describe, do the first pass at describing the collections. Great, thanks so much. So I think that ends the question segment of today's session. Again, if you have questions that were unanswered, they will be responded to and sent to you offline. So before we leave, I want to say a few things. First, I want to thank Anna and Jared for sharing the different ways in which librarians collaborate with researchers to manage metadata workflows for their data. And I want to thank all of the attendees. We hope you found today's presentation useful. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help elects program committees plan new virtual pre-conferences and webinars in the future. 
before we go, I would like to first thank our 10 co-sponsors listed here on the screen. Also, I'd like to remind you that there is still time to sign up for the last two sessions of this virtual pre-conference. Session two will be tomorrow, assessing metadata staffing and workflows. And session three will be on Thursday, techniques and technologies for developing local controlled vocabularies. And there are five in-person Alex pre-conferences being held at ALA Annual Conference in San Francisco, if you're planning to attend. Details and registration for these Alex pre-conferences can be found on the Alex Annual webpage. And you can see the link listed at the, at the bottom of the slide. Finally, I would like to thank Mary Ryder of the Continuing Education Committee for providing technical support for today's webinar. The support she and her colleagues on the technical support subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. I'd also like to thank Emily Whitmore from the ELECS office and members of the ELECS program committee for their help today. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and we hope you will participate in other ELECS webinars and continuing education offerings again in the future.